Good morning to all of you and welcome to worship again this morning. Great to be here with you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Thank you for being here. If we haven't met before, I'm Steve. I'm your senior pastor here at UALC and glad to celebrate the first Sunday after Easter with you. Uh, do you. Do you know the Easter call and response that he is risen? He is risen indeed. That's how we do it. He is risen. Alleluia. That is good news. Alleluia. Thank you for doing that with me. Thank you. Uh, it's funny, I think between our campuses we do that a little bit differently. Better, better sync that up. Uh, it is a joy to be here with you on Easter to celebrate, to remember, to learn the power and grace of the risen and living Lord Jesus who gives joy and freedom to us in all kinds of different areas of our lives. We're starting a series this morning called Free, about the freeing, liberating power of the gospel of Jesus in our lives, and particularly in our, in our relationship with our finances, which doesn't always feel so much like freedom. L let me just ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. And just, I'm going to ask you sort of about the typical person. You might be an exception, but let me ask you, what do you think? For the average person in general, how many hours a day over the course of our lives do you think we spend either earning or spending money? Right? I mean, it's a lot, right? It's, it's a big deal. It might be different for different people, but it's, it's a big deal. And oftentimes it exercises kind of a controlling influence over the choices we make in our lives. And because it's such a big deal, this is kind of my question or my uh, need for the gospel in this, is to ask and to say, if the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't good news for us in this area of our lives, then the gospel is missing a really big area of our lives where we need it badly. So we want to hear the good news of Jesus for us in this area of our lives also. So we're calling this series Free, right? And I want to show you something. Uh, when a, a, few we, uh, a few months ago, when we gave the vision for this series to our communications department, and we asked them to generate some different imagery that we might use for our series journals and for like sermon slides and website and stuff during this series, they gave us a few options. The one that we wound up settling on is what you see on that slide. If you got your journal, it's the one that's on the journal. But one of the other options was this one. <laughs> and uh, even as I show this to you, I'm feeling a little bit of confession and repentance. Like we totally should have used that image instead. Uh, look at these puppies up there. Isn't that awesome? Uh, if any of your dogs are represented on the slides, I'm sorry. We should pay you royalties probably later. But just look how joyful those dogs. So I put these up here mostly to acknowledge that as we talk about our relationship with money, stuff, finance in our lives, that's probably not representative of how we feel, right? Instead of just like free like this, what we often feel is trapped. Of course, money is one of the sources of significant worry, anxiety, stress in our lives. On the other hand, sometimes, which is really just the opposite side of the same coin, it can be a source of unhealthy pride in our lives. Money and our relationship with it can be and has been for probably most of us, maybe nearly all of us at some point in our lives, a source of significant conflict with family, with friends, if you're a married person with your spouse, if you have kids, maybe with your kids. It's a big area of our lives where we can feel trapped. Sometimes in super practical ways, sometimes in ways that would be legitimately described as hardship, financial hardship, Maybe you have been there in life. Maybe you are there in life right now. If you are there in life right now, I want to tell you, you're not alone. There are other people who are hiding it too because that's the game we play in our world. Maybe it's where you are right now. Maybe it's where you will be at some point in the future. For me, I remember a time when Amy and I, where I was in graduate school, we lived in North Carolina. I had a grad student stipend, which is not the fast road to riches, I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, Amy had an office job at the university. And uh, we had bought our first home. It was kind of a stretch for us, not an irresponsible one, but definitely a little bit of a reach for us at a young age, uh, although in graduate school, so not all super young in life, but we had made that move and then uh, had our first mortgage, of course. And then I remember when the, the engine in the truck that I drove to school every day, uh, when that blew. <laughs> and I was like, oh boy, that's gonna be expensive and I'm not at a place where that's good news for me, that's never good news, but especially for us, and we had bought a house that was pretty far out from the city, from Durham, North Carolina, where I was in school, because that's where we could afford something, was farther out in the country, so we were out there. And uh, man, we scraped together, and we put a remanufactured engine in my truck, and within a month, the engine in her Toyota Camry blew. <laughs> like, that's not supposed to happen, that's what, that's a selling point, right, for those cars, right? And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? 
and I take it into the mechanic, and while it is in the shop, they back it out of the bay and lose the transmission. <laughs> and like, you, do you know the Psalms in the Bible that are the how long, O Lord, Psalms? <laughs> I had moved on to the are you kidding me, Lord, Psalms <laughs> at that point. And I was like, I don't know the way out of this dilemma. Like all the possible escape routes that we had planned have already been used up. And it was honestly through the generosity and open-handedness of some people that kind of helped us through a tougher spot. Maybe you've been there, maybe you are there, maybe it's worse. Maybe it's coming for you in your life. We can feel trapped by these things. But the truth of the matter is that even when things are going well in our lives, we're not always well, are we? We sometimes still feel trapped. We sometimes still feel like we're on the hamster wheel, like we can't get free, like we're chasing something that we just can't catch. And, and you guys probably know all the studies. I don't need to uh, prove all this or go to great length at the, all this. But you know that uh, after a certain point, and, and there is a point where more money in life actually is helpful. There is a point where when you don't have access to safe housing, food security, reliable health care, stable transportation, once those kinds of things are solved, every study that's ever been done on this shows that more money, more wealth, more income doesn't actually correlate with more happiness or higher quality of life, but we think it will. <laughs> we act like we think it will. Why is that? Why do we keep chasing all these things? One of my favorite little pieces of evidence in all of these studies, it's pretty granular, but I, I heard this and, and read this uh, probably, probably pushing 10 years ago now, uh, was the little piece of data that the value of our houses and the value of our cars are not statistically correlated with our happiness in life. And, and probably like at some level, we're like, yeah, I mean, I, I get that probably. And, and yet, those are some of the most common things that once we get more income or once we get more assets, that's what we poured into. We already had a good enough house. We already had safe house. It was dry, unlike my basement this week and probably yours too, whatever it is. And we're like, oh, I'm gonna pour more resource into that. I'm gonna pour more resource into that. And it doesn't actually deliver any of the things that we really most value in life. We might get happier with our house or happier with our car, but if that doesn't translate into higher happiness in life, what are we really doing? Why are we doing this? Does the gospel of Jesus have any liberating, freeing, life-giving news for us in these situations? So super enlightening for me one time, when I learned, somebody shared with me, that money in our lives, of course it's not just money, right? It always stands for something else. And what somebody shared with me with an insight I found super helpful and enlightening was that money is tied to different emotions and desires and fears for different people. And it's different for different people. So I'm going to give you a few examples. And I wouldn't be surprised if these match up or they resonate for a lot of you, but it might not be exactly the same for everybody. And you might see like, oh yeah, I get the pattern. And for me, it's just a little bit different than that. But let me just give you, I'm going to give you three examples. But for some of us, money is tied to an emotion around security. Like we know that we want to have something, we know there's risk in life, and we want to guard against that risk in life. And so we think that the more that we can accumulate, the, we'll be able to eliminate threat and risk and danger in our lives. And this is more than just like the emergency fund you're supposed to have so that when the engine blows in your truck, you can do something about it. But, but it's more that like ongoing treadmill of if only more, then I'll be safer. And if only more, then I'll be more secure. And if this is you, you know what that temptation is like in your life, and you know that it never ends. And of the temptations and tie, emotional ties, of the three I'll share with you, this is the one that is my temptation. This is the one that is uh, this temptation for me. For, for others of us, we think about our stuff maybe a little bit more in terms uh, of uh, how we are esteemed by others, what our reputation is, what are what the appearances that we give off to others. So we wonder, like, what will other people think of me based on this thing that I own, based on the clothes that I'm wearing, the overall appearance that I project, the car that's in my driveway, what will my neighbors think, the neighborhood that I live in, the trip that I can talk about when I go back to work, or kids when I go back to school. Like, all of these things say something about me, and they have some sort of relational value. And you could ask yourself, like, when I'm making a purchase or a financial decision, how much am I worried about what other people think of this? Am I getting, am I getting acceptance? Am I getting belonging? Am I giving, getting a cheap substitute for love based on these kinds of things? Or others of us might think more in terms of like enjoyment in life. Like we're almost afraid that we're missing out. We want life to be good, let's call it. And so we're chasing after things that are going to make us happy, that are going to give us some kind of satisfaction, some kind of hit, 
Like we already have a car, but if only if it were a different brand. Or if it not only was that brand, but it had this trim package. Or I already have a perfectly good phone in my pocket, but man, there's a new model. And, oh, and not just the new model, but the pro model. You know, like whatever. It's not like I know what I'm talking about here. Right? Um, <laughs> I could get pretty detailed on this, I'm sure. And we're just afraid that we're going to miss out on some kind of happiness or satisfaction. And so we just keep chasing it. And it does. And it does actually work like for half an hour or sometimes 24 hours. But it's like a drug, isn't it? I mean, you keep chasing that thing and it's just diminishing returns. It never actually delivers. And that's the problem with all three of these things. It's not like it's wrong to have an emergency fund or wrong to enjoy simple things in life, but rather it's that it keeps asking more of us and keeps delivering less, which centuries of Christian theology have said is the very characteristic of idolatry. <laughs> that this is what idols do in our lives. They keep asking us for sacrifice, to sacrifice something else, and then keep delivering only diminishing returns. I don't know if you recognize yourself in one of these particular things, and one of the, the contexts in which I learned this was actually a context uh, of relationship and marriage uh, conversations, because oftentimes in a relationship, or with friends, or extended family, or if you're a married person, or if you're a parent, or whatever, uh, it's tied to different things for us. We just don't realize that. And so then you think you're having a conversation about one thing, but you're having a conversation about a whole different thing. And you can't figure out why you're trapped and stuck and enslaved in this conflict and not free. It can have something to do with that. It turns out that in the reading that we read today, go figure, Jesus was way ahead of us on this and already saw this and already diagnosed this, I think way before us and with greater insight than I know I can manage. And it shows up in the very last line of today's reading. It was this. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, now I want to tell you that this has been one of those things that is a, a teaching of Jesus that I have for a long time thought. This is one of those teachings of Jesus that we don't actually believe. <laughs> this is one of those teachings of Jesus that we kind of disagree with. And Partly, like in our heads, at some level, in theory, we're like, yeah, that's probably true. Like competing allegiances, you're going to hate the one and love the other, or just love the one and despise the other. But at another level, like in our hearts and in our actions and in our attitudes, it's more like Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. And we're like, yeah, but I think I'm going to try. <laughs> like, <laughs> but maybe other people can't, but I think maybe I can. <laughs> I I'm going I'm to give it a go and see how it works out. And I think there is actually some truth to that, but it has occurred to me in recent years that our, our disbelief or our unstated disagreement with Jesus on this point actually happens a step prior to that, or if you prefer, maybe a, a layer beneath that. I think what we struggle to believe here is that our position relative to money is that we're serving it. I think we think we're freer than we actually are. I think we think we're in charge and our stuff is serving us, when to a much greater extent than we realize, we're serving it. Right? Jesus tells us that we are, but we believe that we're free, I think, in spite of the evidence, in spite of the way that we are driven by three or more different underlying desires and fears that we didn't freely choose. They just kind of got there by some pattern we learned we were growing up, by some spiritual addiction to sin, by some enslavement we're there. But by the fact that we keep doing these things even when they never actually deliver what it is that we're chasing after and yet we keep on doing it it's the very definition of being in bondage or in slavery to something and jesus says you can't serve there and serve god but in but in serving god you will experience real freedom in experiencing god you will be set free from these different and all these other kinds of bondage and stuck and trapped and be set free instead there's, there's an underlying truth here that I think we would do well to learn, and it's this. Freedom is not the same thing as independence. Freedom is not the same thing as I'm in charge, I'm free, I have no bounds, I serve nothing at all, I'm just the God of the universe. Because you're not. <laughs> We're not. We will always serve something. There is one creator, there is one God who is not in bondage or serving anything else, but we are creatures, and we are going to serve something. The question is, what is that something doing to you? Now, I'm going to give you one more Bible passage on this and then reflect on it with you for a moment. This is also what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans in chapter 6, in a passage that I have thought for a long, long time is really profound. 
So this passage starts before the verses I've got up on the screen with a hypothetical question. So if, uh, if we're under grace now, if we live in grace and there's forgiveness of sins, why not just go on sinning so that God can keep on forgiving me? Maybe you've thought this before, you've read that passage. Why not just go on with all the fun that sin promises <laughs> because God will just forgive it later anyway? And Paul's answer is that not that like he doesn't say, oh, good question, but let me tell you why that doesn't work. He's like, that, that's not how that works, actually. It's not that you get free and you just sin and life is good and rich and free. You're not independent. You're going to serve something. And this is the first verse and last verse of one part of the argument there. Uh, he said, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. But now, and jump ahead a few verses, you can read the whole chapter later if you want, but now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. You're going to serve something. The question that you get to ask yourself, that we all would be wise to ask ourselves, the thing that I am actually serving in my life, is it leading me to greater joy or is it leading me to more griefs? Is it leading me to being more alive, or is it just leading me to be more dead? Is it giving me greater, real, substantial freedom, or has it just got me stuck in ways that I can barely even tell? We're all serving something, and in serving God, oops, sorry, slide there, but in serving God, God sets us actually free. Think about this. We're over here in the ways that some of us are just chasing after security, thinking we can avoid every risk in life. But the gospel of Jesus says to us, that is a fool's game. You, there is no risk-free position on planet Earth in a fallen world full of sin and full of people like me. But there is one who has laid down his life for us, who has promised to care for us and take care of us and see that we are secure for all eternity, body and soul. And we don't have to chase the empty promise of security on this Earth anymore. We can chase this idol of acceptance and reputation and esteem of others all we want. But even if we were to get there, and we're not going to get there, all we would ever get is somebody who approves of something on the outside of us and not somebody who ever loves the real us, just the mask that we're putting on the outside. And man, we are stuck with that. But we serve a God who has called us his children, who has called us his beloved, and says, welcome to the family of God. Not because of who you are, what you own, what you look like, or anything else, but because of the love of God for you that will not change. And you can be set free from chasing this idol. We might think that we're looking for joy, happiness, pleasure, something in life, and we're just going to miss out, and life's not going to be good if we don't get the newest, latest, most, whatever. But God has given us the promise of the joy of life in his presence, life in his love, life together with his people where we experience peace and contentment that cannot be taken away from us. There's a verse that in the book of Philippians in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul testifies, I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, whether in plenty or in want. Have you learned that secret yet? Most of us have not learned that secret yet, but there is contentment and joy in all circumstances. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us, that nothing else in this world can. When I talk about the freedom that's present for us in the gospel, could I get you to open your uh, the series journals? If you don't have one, <laughs> if you don't have one, just grab one on the way out. But I'll just turn to page two in your series journal. I've kind of put this in slightly different words on the screen up here. You can just look up there if you don't have a journal. But I want you to see here on page two, there's three bullet points there at the bottom of the page. The freedom that we're going to be learning about in this series, the freedom that God gives us, I think comes in at least these three ways. We get internal freedom. We get peace and joy in our souls and in our hearts in place of stress and anxiety and worry. Let me tell you something. I want that <laughs> for me. I want that for you. I want that for us. I know that I'm a different person. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better friend. I'm a better neighbor. I'm a better pastor. When I'm living from an internal sense of peace and joy and not driven by my own anxiety and worry. This is the freedom that comes to us in Christ. We also get the freedom, uh, I'm calling it here on the screen, non-obedience to the crazy. <laughs> we don't have to keep chasing. We don't have to keep doing things that don't help us and actually in the long run probably hurt us. In the journal it says non-obedience to a slave master. We're set free. We are also set free for good. 
We're set free for goodness and joy, and I mean that sense of for good in both of the ways that we can use that phrase. We're set free to do good. We're set free to be kind and open-handed and generous and fair and just and concern for others. We're set free to be opened up in love toward our neighbor and not turned in on ourselves, always concerned about ourselves. We're set free for good, and we're set free for good forever to live now in relationship with God, in the kind of relationship with God that he gives us by his grace and power forever. This is the kind of freedom that comes to us in the gospel of Christ to set us free from the various ways that we are stuck. Can I just give you a little preview of, of what's coming here in the next few weeks? And then you, use your journal. If you don't have it, again, grab one on the way out. But if you were to turn another couple of pages forward, you'll see it's page, I guess, page four. There's a few bullet-pointed questions that this whole freedom is given to us in the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't depend on us getting smarter. It's not a new money management plan. It's not about your asset allocations. What we actually need is an encounter with the guiding, empowering presence of God in our lives who can set us free and lead us. And there's some questions here that I want to invite you. You might just want to do this on your own. At some point, if you're in a small group, you want to talk about your small group, or if you're married to your spouse or with some trusted friends, these are just some reflection questions that I'd encourage you to ask God to help you think about and reflect on in your own life. And then having done that, you can turn, and there's a few key passages that we're going to return to, core teachings in the New Testament in particular, about our relationship with our stuff and our money that are liberating and challenging and empowering. And then when you get past those, there are some, a few places where you can journal your answers to some reflection questions on those passages. Just do that over the course of the series. I think God will lead you into truth and freedom and power in your life. And then over the course of the series, what we're going to do is we're going to hear the gospel for us in all the different roles we play in life. The gospel for us is savers. We're all saving and storing up something. We began to hear that in today's passage. The gospel for us is debtors. The gospel for us is givers. The gospel for us in all these different ways. Uh, the gospel for us is spenders. We all spend something. To hear the good news of Jesus set us free in all these different capacities in which we live. And I also just quickly want to point out to you that already starting this afternoon in our education hour, if you haven't signed up yet, it's not too late, we're running some practical classes because in our sermons on Sunday morning, we're going to come into a liberating encounter with the good news of Jesus and the presence of his Holy Spirit. And you make it to the point you, where God is doing that internal work on you, and you'd like some help with just some best practices, some wisdom, some helpful practical teaching. So we've got classes in our education hour on Sunday afternoons. There's details in the ministry guide, and Pastor Joe's going to share some things at the end of the service. But those are places where uh, we've got two classes running for the next two weeks, and there's two more classes on like budgeting and giving and debt and legacy planning uh, that are happening over the course of this month and into the first week of May. If you want some help with those, I think those will be really fruitful and would encourage you to participate in that. Let me land here, and uh, uh, it might be kind of a weird place to land, but can I show you this picture again for a second? Um, I, I'm laughing at myself once because, I mean, a number of years ago, I remember watching this video that some church leaders made to make fun of themselves, and one of the things they made fun of was when the pastor puts pictures of puppy on the screen to manipulate the audience. And uh, <laughs> I am now a meme of myself, which I just think is kind of hilarious. Um, but here, I want you to notice something about this dog, and the other ones I put up earlier are all the same. Uh, this dog right here is not feral. <laughs> this, this dog is not independent, it's free. You might even notice it has a collar on. There's a little, uh, little tag over there. Uh, this dog is not independent or feral. It's not snarling. It's not worried. It's not snapping at you when you try to get near its food. <coughs> this dog is open and free. It is dependent. It is dependent, not independent. It is dependent on a master who loves it and provides for it. Anybody get where I'm going with this? You see where I'm going, right? It is, it is probably, it is not independent, it is dependent. It is also probably interdependent. It is playing at the dog park with other dogs in joy and sharing its toys and, and all that sort of thing. I, I think, now, I don't mean to say that you're a dog, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not a dog. Uh, although if you're a When Harry Met Sally fan, anybody know the old movie? Somebody, no? Okay, all right. Uh, uh, what we're seeing here, though, I think is a, a picture. It's a picture that can be useful to us of freedom and joy that comes in faith in the God who loves us and cares for us and provides us and saves us and directs us and gives us a, a place to live and to flourish in this world. God grants us freedom and joy in relationship with him. So I want to uh, close this time of reflection on God's word in prayer, praying for God to do this work in me, in you, 
and in us together. And, and I hope that you will lean in on this series in the coming weeks. I think that the gospel of Jesus and his Holy Spirit can do real work, can grow real fruit in all of our lives, and give you more freedom and more joy in a really difficult area of our lives than we ever experienced without him. So let, let's, let's pray for God to do that work in us. Good and gracious God, you, you love us more than we deserve. And we come before you in gratitude for all the good gifts that you have given us in life. And we confess that we, that we, are, we are foolish and we run from you and we most of the time don't even believe you when you teach us about these things. But I pray that you would be our teacher and that you would free us from the fears and desires and longings that we're not even sometimes aware of, but that do bind us and trap us. Pray that you would root your good news, your liberating, powerful, freeing good news in our hearts and, and in our homes and in our relationships and in our communities. We depend on you. Pray that you would do your good work in us and, and give us the courage and the power to follow wherever you lead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn.